Good morning. How's everybody doing? Well, that was pretty lame. It's all good. All right, all right, it's good. So um, my name's Michael. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what we're doing here. <clears throat> I'll give you a little insight. I just woke up about an hour ago. I had a really crazy night, and it was good. I was texting my mom, and uh, I said, you know, I had a really late night. I'm, gonna, I'm in a hurry to get to my conference or my session. It's all good. My, my mom texted back, did you, did you gamble? I said, no, no, I didn't gamble, but I made a lot of really cool new friends. And she texted back, lame. Uh, <laughs> what are we going to do? Okay, so it's, it's all good. So bear with me a little bit. Um, my name is Michael. I'm with Nationwide Insurance. And we're going to talk about um, visualization as a means of communication. So this is kind of my insight to what I've done with the company for a long time. Um, there's my email. Uh, I, got a, I have a blog that I post to occasionally. You can read it if you want. It's kind of boring. It's no big deal. All right, so here's what we're going to talk about. So the first thing we're going to do is a narcissistic tirade. I like talking about myself, and they told me I had to, so I kind of went with that. It's like, ah, I'm pretty cool. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what is communication, what's the point of a story, and we're going to touch on why visualizations stale, fail, and then we're going to hit on 10 steps. And this is the bulk of what we're talking about. So I've developed these 10 steps from data inception to decision making. And, and, and it, we're going to go through that. And then last what we're going to talk about unicorns. Everybody likes unicorns, right? It's all good. All right, so this is me. That's a really good picture of me. I don't look like that norm normally, but we'll go with it. So I started my education um, at Ohio State University. Woo, go Buckeyes. Yeah, right? Um, I was a photography major. Um, I went to the art, arts college, and uh, I started learning that. Really quickly, I realized that I like photography, but I also like money and not working weekends. Um, so that didn't really work out for me. So I realized that, uh, eh, I like the concept. I'm not really good on the, uh, the fine arts parts. So, so I got a job in IT. Um, at that point, uh, digital photography was really new, upcoming, um, and I realized I was in computers anyway, and so it was really good. Um, so I got a job doing a, a Y2K conversion. Um, that dates me a little bit, unfortunately, but you know, uh, you know that was a thing, right? Um, after that, I jumped into Nationwide. Um, Nationwide, I've been with the company for about 15 years, and uh, I worked in the call center, so solving problems, doing things. The thing about call centers, in, in general, call centers have tons of data. Um, they, they gather input, they gather output, they gather all this stuff, and Nationwide is a very CI, continuous improvement focused environment. So we, we had this opportunity to really drive into it. Um, so I got an option, an opportunity to really dig into data and, and its inception. What do you do with data? What do you do with it? So we want to make things better, we want to make things faster, and, and I got that opportunity. So I, and my next role was uh, actually diving into workforce management. Workforce management, if you've not known it, is, is really um, in-depth. It's a detail. How many people do I need to answer this many calls that are coming through? How many calls am I going to get through? So there's a lot of uh, predictive analysis. There's a lot of uh, focus to it. And it was, it was really exciting. So I went back to school. I realized that I needed to go and get some more education. So I went back to Ohio State. Why not, right? Um, to the Fisher College. And I started a business degree. And uh, the business degree was, uh, was statistics focused. And I realized really quickly, I started photography, and I moved into statistics. Statistics, uh, a lot of people are very confused about that. But what, what, when, when I talk about those two things together, people don't realize that I went photography, statistics, that doesn't make any sense. It really does, right? So photographers are not trained like traditional artists. They, they are not creating like the painter or a sculptor does. They're actually taught to capture something. So when, when we go in there and we say, what does a photographer do? In the right light, in the right camera lens, in, in the right angle, you capture something interesting. You capture something beautiful, and it's important. Statistics isn't really that different. We use math models. We use software. We use computers. But what we're actually doing is we're finding a nugget in, in that data, and we're capturing that, and we're putting it to light. So these two things kind of really um, they, they, they coincided for me. It made, made, made sense. There was no um, differentiation. And what that really did for me is realize that when, when visualization, so, so Tableau came onto the scene about 2004, 2005. We're a little late. You can see by my timeline. But the leader I had at the time said, you know, our data structure doesn't make sense. We're, we're not doing what we need to do. We need to, we need to bring it up. And so they said, um, what about visualization? Visualization is a big deal. Um, so we sat down and we talked about it. We evaluated several tools, and Tableau was the right tool at the time. Um, between my photography education, 
and my statistics education, it was perfect for me. I was like top dog. I got it. It was really cool. I could, I could sit in there and I could make a beautiful dashboard that made sense to people, that people actually used. It was awesome. Um, so I became that Tableau champion. Um, it was definitely not a, an assigned title. Um, I made it up myself. We're talking about narcissistic, right? And so it was me. So uh, I, I basically got Tableau into Nationwide and I said, guys, this is the right way to go. This is what we need to do and this is how we're going to do it. Um, and, and we, we kind of grassroots solved it from the bottom up. And over the, the course of time, I was, I was doing a really awesome job. We were doing dashboards all over the place, and it was fantastic. Um, but then I realized really quickly that I was a big fish in a small pond. And, uh, you know, who wants to be the big fish in a small pond? It's cool, it's great, but I need to go further. So I went out and started teaching people. I said, guys, what are we doing here? What, why, why are your dashboards not working? So I could sit down and I could show somebody how to build a dashboard in Tableau, and it sucked. It was terrible. And it was really bad, and I didn't understand what was going on. I'm, like, I'm not a bad teacher. What's going on? So I realized that um, what I had behind the scenes was data governance. I didn't know what to call it at that point because I didn't know what it was. It was like, you know, if your data sucks coming in, uh, your, your dashboard's going to suck going out, right? Uh, so I, to me, that was just common sense. It was knowledge. It was input. Uh, and, and that's the way I rolled with it. But I realized that that's not a common occurrence. So most people dive into Tableau from a very top-down menta mentality, and they get, this is cool, this is good, I'm going to make a dashboard, but they don't understand what's behind the scenes. So I took a lateral move into data governance. Data governance is all about reading a book, white paper, whatever the case is, understanding what should be done, and telling everybody else what they need to do. Um, if you can see from my, my career path, I am not that kind of person. I am a problem solver. I'm a creative. I like to find a problem, fix it, go on with it. So data governance was horrible. It was terrible for me. It needed to happen. I learned a lot from that, but you can see it was very short-lived. short -lived. So I learned a lot. I got a lot of uh, direct terminology that I could apply to these things that I was doing with common sense, and the common sense piece of it kind of just went through. Um, but but I, I didn't stay there very long. It was terrible. So the next role I got was a data strategist, and that sounds really, really fancy and all sorts of stuff, but it's, it's not really. So the one thing I realized is that I realized that data from beginning to end, it, you have to understand the story. You have to understand every single piece of it going through. I don't know how to do all that stuff, but I know what happens. And so the role that I'm in currently in Nationwide is, it's kind of like an inside consulting role. So we have customers that come to us that say, you know, I've got most of what I need but I need help with this little thing, this little thing, this little thing. Cool, I can help you out with it. Um, so I work with marketing. I work with finance. My, my primary role is with infrastructure. Um, but I can branch out. I can basically take it anywhere I want to go. And it's really, really fun for me because I'm so ADD. I don't stick with one thing for a very long time. I need to fix a problem. I need to move on. Because if I fix a problem and it's fixed, then why am I still here? Um, so, so this is the thing where I'm at. So the one thing that I really like about what I've done is that I've realized over my course of my, you know, 15-ish years with the, the company that there is a beginning and there's an end. Um, and if you don't know the beginning and the end, then you can't really tell the great story. And if you can't tell a great story, then what are we doing as analysts, right? So let's go through this. Ooh, back up one. Let's talk about what is communication. So communication is a glance uh, in a crowded room. It's a touch on the shoulder. It is uh, uh, a look. It can be words. It can be a dashboard, anything like that. Communication is everything. We, we communicate as people to each other. Um, visualization happens to be the most efficient and most effective means of communication right now. We are visually centered people. Um, you know, we evolved, if you believe in that to be visually sighted. So when I see a picture of a big thing or a small thing, my brain automatically translates that to big and small. If I see a number on a page, um, my brain translates that into a visual context. So until we get like matrix style downloads into our brain, visualization is the fastest, most effective, effective way to communicate our understanding to someone else. Stories. So what do we do with stories? So stories are our means to communicate to someone else. So we basically say, I'm going to tell you something. So that's how we communicate. So in, in one words, a lot of times we have to say, you know, I want to share my ideas with you. I want to share my understanding with you. I want to just put myself out there so you get what I'm saying. The, the reason we tell stories is, is very um, diverse. But in business, let's get back to the real thing, right? So we're talking about fantasy and all that good. But 
Uh, in business, the reason we tell a story is to provide our understanding of a data set or an understanding to someone who's gonna make a decision. Sometimes that person is us, sometimes that's an executive, but we really need to understand that a story is, here's what I'm thinking, I want you to understand what I'm thinking. And, and, and if you can communicate that story to somebody else, you've done your job really well. Why do visualizations fail? So, so I'm gonna ask the audience a question, and you guys can shout out, or not, you can be quiet, it's all cool. Why do you think visualizations fail? I mean, it's up on the screen, but, but tell me. I mean, what makes a visualization bad? What's wrong with it? Too busy? Anybody else? Okay, lack of context, good, I like that, right? So, I'm, if I'm telling a story, and I know a small piece of it, right? Um, where did the data come from? Where did it go? Um, Cotton Eye Joe? It's all good. But <laughs> so, so what I realized is that I went out and taught people, and I said, here's how you use Tableau. Here's how you use the visualization. Here's how you tell a story with important data in a, in a picture. And it failed consistently, and I had, to, I had to really sit down and figure out what was wrong with it. And what I realized is that um, people don't know the whole story. They don't get it. They don't get the concept. So I know this small piece of what I'm doing right now, but I don't understand the beginning. I don't understand the end. Who's going to make that decision? What are they going to do with that decision? Why do they need to know that information? And so you can make a beautiful visualization, but if nobody understands the whole story, the big picture, uh, then you're failing. And so these people that I was teaching were, were basically were, were not succeeding because they didn't know the beginning, they didn't know the end. So I realized that we need to go and figure out what these 10 steps are. So arbitrary, completely arbitrary, 10 steps from data inception to data decision. And now granted, um, I'm sure that somebody could come up with 15 steps or 20 steps or 30 steps, but for me, I like to break it down in a nice even number. I like 10, 10's a good number, right? So we're gonna talk about each one of these steps a little bit, really briefly. Um, I don't wanna bore you guys, but here's what we go. So you gotta plan, you gotta identify the data, collect it, enhance it, understand it, experiment with it, apply logic, which is really fun, um, package it, and communicate, and, and then uh, revise. So the, the point of building a dashboard, building a Tableau dashboard, any, any kind of communicate is step number eight. Right? So, so what I realized is that people were diving in and they were doing this dashboard analysis and they were building dashboards and they were really cool, but that's one-tenth of the whole process. It's not the whole thing. If you don't get the whole concept, not, granted, not everybody has the skills to do everything, step one to 10, but if you're diving in and doing one-tenth of that process, of course it's gonna fail. It's not gonna be right. You have to understand at least what's going on with that. So let's talk about it a little bit. Step one, plan a little bit. Right? So uh, you have to understand what's going on, you have to work with your customer, and you have to say, where am I going with this? What are we doing with it? You know, it's not even about building a dashboard. What are the decisions that you're gonna make with this data? Why are you gonna do it? What's going on? Uh, so you have to know the strategy. It's very high level. Uh, you just have to get some information. So um, think about the Transcontinental Railroad, right? So I just recently finished uh, uh, Hell on Wheels. It's a really awesome series. But it made me think, right? So, so it's a TV show, but it's talking about they, they you know, made a railroad from one end of the continent to the other. They didn't go through and actually plan every single rail, every single tie, every single everything that went through there because it didn't make sense, right? So if I went out and I planned every single step of that going through, one, by the time I actually got there, it took several years, the data would be stale. A flood could wash away a plane, uh, a forest could take out a fire, you know, or a fire could take out a forest, not the other way. <laughs> but anyway, the concept is, is that you have to know kind of where you're going. So they knew where they the started and it went where it went and needed to end, but they didn't really plan every single step of the way. You have to go with it. So, so don't let your road turn into a river. So uh, I say this a lot of times, this is my thing, right? So if I'm on a road trip, I can take a side path to go to McDonald's. I can take a restroom break. I can do whatever I want. But if I'm on a river, that river takes me wherever I want to go. So you can't stop. You can't change your path. A lot of times when we do analysis, we need to shift directions and things like that. So the idea is, is that we need to plan, but not a whole lot. So here's one of my favorite quotes. So Abraham Lincoln, give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax. It's all about, I know what I'm gonna do with this, I need to do something important, and I'm gonna go with it. Put in good counterpoint, Winston Churchill. Plans are of little importance, but planning is essential. You need to do the action of planning, you need to understand that what I'm doing is important, 
but it's not married. You know, you're not married to it. You need to move on and go through it. Step number two, identify the data. So basically what I'm talking about is I know what I need to answer. Where does it exist? How does it exist? Where is it? In business, I'm sure you guys all see this, um, when I need access to data, it's a long process. It's really frustrating. So, so where does it exist? How do I have to submit the request to get the access and things like that? So it's boring, but I put it at the beginning of my steps because a lot of times it takes a long time. So I will basically ask for more than I need. Where does it exist? I, I need all the stuff. Go forward. Go, go through it. So it's not really a fun step, but I know what I need. I'm going to ask for more than I need because the process takes a long time. But also at the same time, you, you know what you, what you think you need. It could change, right? All right. Step number three is collect the raw data. So this could be many forms. So I've got ETL processes like Informatica. I've got uh, emails of Excel spreadsheets, all this other stuff. So there are a lot of different ways to acquire data. The way you acquire the data needs to match the necessity of what you're doing, right? So if I have a one-month update spreadsheet um, and the data comes in to me from somebody that emails me, like we do a finance a lot of times. And finance, they don't like to share their data. Um, so, so they just email us a spreadsheet once a month, right? Why would I spend time automating that? I may save two minutes a day because all I do is I get that data in, I upload it into my data mart, and that's good. What's the point of automating it? But if I have a daily, daily process that uh, people need to access on a regular basis and it's good, I'm going to build an ETL for it. So, so when I talk about this, it, 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 the, the process, the tooling needs to fit what you're actually doing with it. Step number four is clean and enhance. So I don't know if you guys are familiar, but Stephen Few is one of our visualization contemporaries. Um, whatever. He tells this really good point whenever he speaks. He talks about the way we're gathering data. So in the last 10, 20, whatever, five years, we've gathered so much data. Like, we gather uh, information about how you drive from a device that's in your car, GPS data. We know fitness trackers. We know how many steps you're taking on a regular basis. Uh, the other thing, I actually uh, went shopping for a refrigerator, and I saw a refrigerator that actually had a weight sensor in it that would text me when my milk was running low. And it's crazy. It's crazy. Well, what are we going to do with that? Like, do I really need an email from my refrigerator? Let's be honest. Come on, guys. So. What I realize, what Stephen Few puts out there, and I, I'm going to uh, reiterate it, is in the last five or ten years, we've gathered so much more data. Our job as analysts is to really find the needle in the haystack, right? I need to find something exciting. So from photography and statistics, what I do is I find that interesting point, and I bring it out, and things like that. So what we're really doing is we're adding a whole lot more hay to the stack and not a whole lot more needles. So if I need to find that needle in the haystack, what I'm doing is actually just you know, drowning myself in data that I don't need. So the first thing I do whenever I sit with a data set or a project is to say, what do I not need? Clean it up, get rid of it, all the stuff that you don't need. And that can be uh, filtering, that can be uh, you know, data source, whatever the case is, but when you get rid of stuff you know you don't need, then, then you can actually enhance it with stuff you do need. So I'm gonna join it with another data set that's important, but I'm not gonna join it with all this crap that I don't need. So from a very technical standpoint, this is a, a spreadsheet view. So, so even though we love Tableau, Tableau is a column-based data system, we all think about data in a row and, and column-based, right? So it's a relational data set. So the first thing we do is uh, global extract filters to eliminate rows. So if I know that I only need data from the last month, why would I pull in data from the last three years? And also, I only need six columns out of the 55 columns that I'm dealing with. Get rid of those two. So when you look at this, what's highlighted is the things that I don't need. You can see that if I ask uh, any application, Tableau or whatever it be, to query the data set, if I'm querying everything, it's going to take a long time. If I'm querying only the things that are not highlighted, it's going to be a little bit faster. So this is a step that a lot of people miss out on. So you know, when, when I'm building a dashboard, it's, it's good, it's important to sit there and say, let's crank it out. But if it starts to get slow, as it gets clunky, like I'm, I'm running a query on sales data for 16 years, but I only really care about the last three months. Get rid of it. Get out of it. Don't matter. So this is where I think a lot of people um, lack the understanding of, let's, let's just go through and let's do what we need to do. All right, step number five. So understand the data. So we talk about uh, 
getting a, getting a good concept. Where does the data go? What does it do? Uh, things like that. So if I captured my data on the first of the month versus the 15th of the month, is that going to change? You have to understand from a business perspective. Um, let's think about production facilities, right? So most production facilities will shut down for a couple of months at a, at a, at a year. Um, you know, is that a big deal or not? I worked in a call center for a lot of my, my, uh, my career, and we basically, we, we were open 24-7, but the volume of calls that came in on Saturday and Sunday was about a tenth of the total volume. So if I, as a data analyst, started looking at the data and I said, you know what, this is amazing, this is really cool, uh, but your volume drops off to 10% on Saturdays, and the customer's like, yeah, and? You need to know what's going on. You have to understand the data with the business perspective. Think about Chinese New Year. So uh, my wife actually works in production, and uh, about two, three, four weeks out of the year, um, they get no shipments from China because they shut down. China shuts down for Chinese New Year. It's just what it is. So if I look at you know, December, January, whatever, and I see my volume drops off, yes, the volume drops off. It's okay. So you have to understand where it goes uh, and what's, what's actually useful about that data. One of the things that we use is conceptual data models. So I need to know where the data is coming from, where it goes to, and how it joins. So this is a tool that I work a lot with. Ooh, back up one more. We're not there yet. So conceptual data models help me understand what the customer is doing with the data. And this is a tool that I can put in front of a customer. It's not fancy. I mean, yeah, it's got some, you know, the, the join symbols and stuff like that. It's a little complicated, but you can explain to them. Cardinality is not hard to explain. So one to many, many to one. Where's my data? So, so this is our data, one of our data sets at Nationwide. We gather currency information. And I need to know from all these different sources of data, where they come from, how do they join to my other data. And I could put this in front of a customer and say, does this make sense to you? Are you good with that? And it, it works really well. It's not complicated. It's not you know, really crazy. It's just simple. And it works really well. The customer can tell me, you know what? This is all good, but in January, you're going to see zero because we shut down. Or, um, you know, July 4th, a lot of factories will shut down for two weeks in, on July to give everybody a holiday. That's what it, we go with. So step number six, evaluate and experiment. Um, so this is kind of, this is our job as analysts. We basically need to think. Um, and the best way to do that is to make a hypothesis and prove it right or wrong. Um, I think that I see this in the data. Is that accurate? Is it not accurate? Um, how do I test that? What, what do I think? I think that your call volume drops to 10% on Saturdays. Well, yes, you can prove that in the data. I think that the reason your call volume drops to 10% on Saturdays is because you have fewer customers. Okay, let's, let's prove that. Is it fewer customers or is it just less calls? So, so we go through that. So I love to say this is our bread and butter as analysts. This is what we do, right? I'm not a... Um, I'm not a maker. I don't do things. I, I think. I'm a thinking person. I solve problems. I do things like that. So this is where I spend the most of my time when we go through it. I'm going to give you a couple examples um, of, of, of what I'm talking about, right? So this is a, it's a pretty complicated uh, visualization, but I'll, I'll give you through it. So the original assumption that they came to me, a call center, right? So we get calls in, we get calls out, we answer calls, all that sort of stuff. Somebody said, you know, our calls are taking too long. These calls are taking too long. We're not meeting our goals. We're not meeting our SLAs. Why are these calls taking too long? So what I did is I put together this, this information. So what we realized is that this is a histogram with a Pareto chart. Uh, it's, it's super complicated, but if you see the, the shaded gray area on the bottom there, that's the volume of calls, so 10%. And then the shaded area at the top of that chart that's kind of the curve, that's the resource utilization. So how many minutes am I spending talking to these people? So the assumption is, is all our calls are taking too long. When I threw this into data, and I said, is that true? Is that not true? And I evaluated it, and I realized that that was very false, and that's okay. The actual assumption was wrong, but the output was is that a few calls are taking way too long. So we look at this and we say, the top 10% of our volume, so 10% of our calls, are taking 30%, 27% of our resources. We don't want that. That's bad, right? We want 10%, 10%, 50%, 50%. So what we realized is that there was a, a long tail on this data. So I'm basically seeing that 10% of our calls are taking 30% of our volume. Think about the decision that was made based on that data, right? If all my calls are taking too long, what's the solution to that? Everybody talk faster. Hang up the phone. Move quick, right? If only 10% of your data or 10% of your volume is taking up 30% of your call, I can target that 10%. The decision made by the executives was so much different based on that realization, not just the data decision. So 
we, we need to understand what we're doing, we need to make questions about it, and we need to go for it. Here's another really good one. Workforce management. So anybody in the room deal with workforce management? Ah, okay, cool. So workforce management is really complicated. It's how many phone calls am I gonna get, widgets, whatever you wanna call it, how many people do I need to handle those widgets, and when are those calls coming in? When are they coming out? I need to set people in their seats at the right time so that I'm using my resources effectively. Like, yeah, I can hire 100 people and have them sitting here at 2 a.m., what's the point? So workforce management is all about forecasting, understanding where you're going with it, and then realizing what you're doing with it. When I came onto the workforce management team, um, they were forecasting and they were measuring their success based on, I forecasted the right number of phone calls, and I forecasted the right number of AHT, which is average handle time, right? So, so how long those calls took? And you can see in the top right, the green shows that I'm within like 3%. I'm, I'm really good. But then they're actually, the this SLA, which is service level agreement, uh, I agreed that I will answer your calls within this amount of time. Oh, we're way freaking off. And they didn't get it. They didn't understand what's going on. So they brought me in and they said, Michael, you need to look at this and figure out what's going on. So, so what we did was we said, okay, what's your hypothesis? I know how many calls I'm getting. I know how long each call is gonna take. And I'm answering those calls, but I'm not answering them in the right time. It's not good. So I broke this out. The thing that I realized was that each type of call that came into our call center was different. So they came in at different times. They took different amounts of length. Their duration was different. And so I put this visualization together. So if you look at this, uh, it's a little crazy, but the green stars are within 15% plus or minus. So that means that I gave you a 30% leeway of forecasting how many calls and handle time you needed versus what you actually got. And you can see there's some green stars but there's not a lot of green stars. So then I, I took it a step further and I said, well, why are you wrong? So the up arrows are you forecasted over, the down arrows are you forecasted under. So you can see there's about half of this visualization is green stars and the other half is not green stars. This is really cool. This gave them, the workforce management team, uh, understanding that we need to break it out, we need to forecast differently, we need to measure it differently. But then I realized that how do you package that to an executive? Um, you know, I can't put this in front of my CEO and say, here's what's going on. He, he doesn't care about that, he's not important. So we need to bubble that up to something that they looked. So I'm gonna go back one slide and I'll show you what we talked about. On the left-hand side of this diagram, you see there's a bullet chart. Um, and that bullet chart says 44% accurate, 27 over, 29 under. That's a lot more consumable for them. They, they understand that concept that is okay. So, is 44 where I want to be? No, you need to be about 75, 80% accurate. So that gave them a target, that gave them a metric to work for. So this was understanding, uh, you know, what the question was, how we dealt with it, and where we go from that. Apply business logic. Okay, so I know that it's not really interesting information, but this is where the, the piece comes through. So do I know, as a data analyst, I'm looking at my data and I understand it, what does it actually mean from a business perspective, right? Um, is, is the definition that the business is doing with it accurate to me? So let's do a little experiment. How many people in the room are wearing a white shirt? Raise your hands. It's all good. I know everybody's asleep, it's okay. Second day of the conference, okay, good. So what, I'm wearing a white shirt. What does a white shirt mean? So if my customer says, you're wearing a solid plain white shirt, and versus something that's not. You need to understand that. So my understanding of what the customer wants can be skewed. Well, what about plaid? It's a white background. What about spots, polka dots? What about a sweater? Is a sweater technically a shirt? I don't know, what does the business want? What about a blazer? I mean, it's classy, it's sexy, but you know, is a blazer with a black shirt under it considered a shirt necessarily? You need to know what your customer considers a white shirt. So a lot of times we sit there and we say, I know as a data analyst what you're talking about. Your data says you have zero white shirts. Well, but what if my white shirt is just a shirt with a background, you know, a plaid shirt, whatever the case may be. So this is what I'm talking about. This is, on a technical standpoint, we're talking about like data dictionaries. We're talking about conversations with the customer, understanding what they consider to be what you think it is. So you can interpret it into the data. A lot of times we sit there and we, we think we know what we want. Uh, we think we know what we need. But we really don't. Our customers, our business customers, are the person that tells us what I want. I can say, this is a white shirt. It's solid, it's, it, you know, there's, no, there's no spots, there's no stripes, there's no blazer, there's no sweater, it's a white shirt. But the customer says, you know what? I really wanna capture sweaters too. I wanna capture polka dots, but not white polka dots on a black. I wanna capture 
black polka dots on a white. I said, you need to get that out of their head. You need to go for it. Well, I'll give you an example. This is a very, this is a very complicated visualization, but I'm going to walk you through it. <clears throat> the customer came to me in the call center and said, I need a target for handle time that customers can, that, that I can work with my associates, my analysts, and say, you are talking too long, you're talking too short. So setting a target X number of seconds for every call type, it was, it was really kind of a daunting task, right? So we, we, we basically said, There's, this is only showing about 10 different types of calls. In the call center I worked with, we had about 30 different types of calls. So the minute that I set that, you know, that threshold, that target for one call type, it becomes stale. What if we have an outage? What if uh, people are talking about, you know, you know, they're calling in because something's wrong? Well, my calls get really short, but we don't solve the problems. What if um, we have a new analyst that's training? Well, they're going to take a little bit longer, and it's okay, so their target doesn't make sense. So the answer, or the question was, is I need a target for every single call type that comes through, and I need to know that that analyst is taking the right amount of time to answer that call. It didn't make sense. So, so I sat down and I realized, what are they actually doing with that? We, we, we had conversations and we realized that what I'm actually doing is I want to have a conversation with my associate. I want to have a conversation with a person that reports to me to say, you're doing a good job, you're doing a bad job. And that's not necessarily metric or threshold related, right? Everybody's very focused on um, here's where you're at, here's where everybody else is at, this is good, this is bad. So what I did is I put together this bullet chart. So what a bullet chart does is it shows you every, everything from a beginning to an end and, and kind of breaks it up into that. So the bullet chart actually shows what your peers are doing. So everybody who took calls and password took, you know, took calls anywhere from 400 to uh, 2,000 seconds. And the median's here in the first quartile and the second quartile. And I overlaid that with a blue circle. The blue circle is where that individual analyst was actually performing on that one day. So you can look at this and I can say, you know, the first two, three um, <clears throat> call types, my analyst, blue circle, is actually performing pretty close to average, median, whatever you want to say, with the rest of her peers. But then I bump it down and I say, you know what, if I look at client management, which is the fifth or sixth line down there, my blue circle is way to the right. That means you're taking, this analyst is taking way longer than everybody else in that general. Do they need training? Do they need anything else? What was going on? Are you just slacking off? And, and in retrospect, you go down to the, like, the bottom rows, right? So connectivity. So everybody takes a huge range of calls, and you're taking them a lot faster than everybody else because your, your blue circle is, is, is further to the left. Are you doing something that I need to know about? you have a tip that you can give to your associates, your peers, anything like that? What in the world are you doing that makes it so much better than everybody else around you? So what I did is I put this in front of them, <clears throat> and of course, you, you, we've dealt with people. They ask for one thing, you give them something else, and they don't like it, right? So it took a lot of time to change their minds to realize that this is what you need to have that conversation. But once they got it, they said, you know, this is really good. I don't have to say you're over or under your target. It's a set number. I can say that you're pretty good. You're, you're, you're equitable with your peers and things like that. So this enabled the request. So they said, I need to have a conversation with my associates, my call takers, to say if you're performing or not performing. This answered that question not the way they wanted it exactly, but it was really successful. <clears throat> Step number eight, I call it package the analysis. So this is where I've learned all this stuff, one through seven, and I've got all this together, and now I'm going to build a dashboard. So um, this is where we put it together. So we're at the Tableau conference. I have to talk about Tableau as a dashboard, but really building a dashboard is not always the right answer, right? So if somebody comes to me and says, Michael, answer this question from data. Well, the answer is a yes or a no question. It's just as easy to put a post-it note on somebody's desk than it is to do that. A lot of times that, you know, they want a simple answer. They want an email. They want a, a words, the things about it. So package the analysis is not just building a dashboard. It's basically grabbing everything that I've learned and communicating it to the person who's making the decision. So um, dashboards are awesome and they're fantastic, but keep in mind that a dashboard is not always the right answer. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of insights into the dashboards that I've done. <clears throat> So this is a production um, operational dashboard. So they basically, the call center had all these metrics that they were pulling together, and they had KPIs, and they had all this good stuff about it, and they said, let's, let's put something up on the board, let's have a cabinet meeting, let's talk about it. I don't know if you guys noticed it, but the first thing that I realized about this dashboard is that there are no numbers on this dashboard at all. Um, 
it, it wasn't about the numbers. I don't care if 75 or 80% is good or bad. I want to know that 75% is good and give me a red circle or green circle or 60% is bad, give me a red circle. So, so we aggregated this together and I also want to know how did it change from last month. So this dashboard itself is just colors and it's dials and everything like that. So anybody in the room, who, is, who has had a customer that has said, I need speedometers, I need dials? Raise your hands, right? And how does that make you feel? It's a little dirty, right? It's a little gross. It's like dials are not the right way to visualize this kind of data. So the, the, the idea that I came up with, they, they insisted on speedometers and dials, and I'm like, guys, th this is wrong, because you can't really gauge a percentage by a, a twist of a, an arrow. You can't really know that a percentage circle on a half of it. No, it's wrong. Oh, I took a step back. I said, why do they want dials? Why do they want speedometers? Specifically in this case, this was um, a very executive level dashboard and 90% of the executives that were reading this dashboard were of a very specific demographic. So they were uh, baby boomers or older. And I thought about that, like does that, make a, does that make a difference? These people were originally consuming data, think about when they were five or six years old. The first time they saw data was from a dial, was from a radial thing like that, you know, vacuum tubes, uh, radio dials, anything like that. So that's their first language to interpreting data. People like me that are millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, we grew up with digital. So we know what a bullet chart looks like, we know that a number on a screen looks like, but we don't get the concept that these people, their first language of data inception and consumption was from dials, was from radial things. And so if I'm trying to communicate to someone an insight that I have and they want to speak in their first language, why would I speak in another language? So I gave them dials. The cool thing behind the scenes, these aren't really dials. They're, they're simply an icon set. So I found an icon set that had five steps, one, two, three, four, five, and I gave them that. And so it's not a dial. It doesn't like nudge a little bit to 70% to 80% or anything like that. It's simply, you know, one, two, three, four, five. It got the point across to them and they got the point. Uh, and I didn't have to do some crazy complicated tableau logic to get there. It was just pretty. It was clean and simple. So if you ever know, you know what Harvey balls are. So you got the, the quarter circle, half circle, full circle, all that stuff. Same freaking thing. It's just a dial. And they loved it. They think it was great and it's fantastic. So I met their need without having to go complicated, without having to go really deep into it. So the other, the other piece that I put out here is red, yellow, green. So anytime we talk to data visualization professionals, they hate red, yellow, green. They don't like it because red, yellow, and green have a preconceived notion. So if I see red, that means stop, that means you know bad, that means whatever. If I see green, it's good, go faster, whatever the case is. In the, in the sense of, this is an operational dashboard. I need to know that things are right, I need to know that things are wrong. Absolutely use red, yellow, and green because it's absolutely what I want to do with it. So never sit down and say, it's bad to use red, yellow, green in a dashboard because you want to communicate that thing. So a really interesting thing, I, uh, I was talking with one of my, my peers about um, red, yellow, and green, and, and she said, you know, she's from China, and she said, you know, stock exchange. So if anybody's seen American stock exchange, you know, tickers, right? Red means the stock went down, green means the stock went up. In China, it's actually different. It's crazy. So in China, red means the stock went up, and green means, I don't know if it's a green, but whatever the case is. So Red means my stock went up. And so I need to know my customer when I talk about this. If I was producing this dashboard for predominantly Chinese consumers, I would not use red to say bad. I would use red to say good. Uh, you have to understand where you're going with that. So packaging the analysis, gathering that data into, into itself, and it's, it's really important. All right, so <clears throat> this is another piece of it, right? So when we package the analysis, um, we, we basically have to make interesting data. So this is one thing that I did. Let's see, go back here. Let's see if I can open this up. All right, so this is a dashboard I did. So Nationwide is a very uh, continuous improvement company. We, we love to have things taught, we have things learning. And so one of the initiatives we have is a Teaching Thursday. It's basically peer-led training about all sorts of stuff. So every other month or every other week, we get together and we talk about what we know and what we learn. The data that they need to gather from that is boring. It's like, oh, who cares how many people went, how many people did that? So it's not exciting data. Like, we're not talking about production facilities, how many widgets you made, how long it took you to make the widgets. It's how many people showed up in a room, right? But 
on the other side, is it's, it's actually pretty important. Like, we need to drive this. Um, we need to make people understand how cool it is, what's going on with this. So what I packaged the analysis, you need to understand that this dashboard, it's not exciting data, but we need to make it exciting for people to read. Um, so we have to make it pretty. We have to make it visual. So anytime you put it together a dashboard, if it's ugly, people aren't going to read it. It's, it's boring. Like, the data itself is boring. But if you make a pretty dashboard with boring data, people might actually look at it. So they're cool with it. So, so what I did is I grabbed this data, and I'm going to give you a few pointers on how to make a dashboard pretty. Um, not really in depth, but the first thing I'll talk about was, uh, is, is this, this little chart right here, right? So if I go to the sheet specifically, we look at, it is several different icons that I picked from a free icon website that talk about these numbers. So there's this really cool thing. You can, you could do the same thing with several sheets in a dashboard, but it's faster to do it with one sheet. So I use this little placeholder thing. Placeholder basically gives you a spoof of a, uh, of a, of an axis that you don't have to worry about. So let's look at placeholder. The calculation for placeholder is, come on, Michael. Right. Really complicated. It's a number one. So what you can do with this is you can drop this into your, uh, your columns, and it actually, you can do the rows as well, but it simply gives you the ability to change your mark type with the, the actual, every single axis. So what it comes out to is that every single one of these looks like a separate axis. Tableau treats it as a different mark type, which means that I can change that background. So that icon that I do for a number of students or, or for a um, number of locations, it's not fancy, it's just, it makes it pretty. It makes people really like it. Let's talk about one more. So the other thing I do here in this dashboard is, how do we break out things like that? So these are our executive leaders and nationwide uh, within the INO company. And I break it out by, by, at the bottom by location. So how many people do we have in Columbus versus Des Moines, Dublin, all these different locations? And you can see these bubble charts, but inevitably you're gonna have a customer say, you know, location's cool, but I wanna see it by something else. Let me see how many people re, re, were dialing into my session remote versus actually in the office. So you could build a second sheet, a second dashboard. What I actually did with that is I basically did a little parameter that basically shifts the view, okay? So, so here's what's cool about it. So when I shift that view, it's, it's a, I'll show you guys in a second, but the idea behind it is, is that I don't wanna make people go to a separate sheet or separate dashboard to get the information they're looking at. I want it to be easy to consume, I want it to be good because these people are executive level, they don't have time to go to another sheet, another dashboard. So the way I went about this, <clears throat> I'll give you guys this really quickly. So we did a detail parameter. So this parameter was what grain do I want to look at? What, what detail do I want to look at? And I broke it out, string parameter, no big deal. Um, and then what that parameter does is it drives the leader level calculation, right? Or the, uh, the data calculation. So I'm going to go here. So I drew a calculation that actually drove that through us, right? It's a case statement, simple, right? This is wrong, but you get the concept. <laughs> so this is the same thing, but from lead level. But when the parameter says X, then give me Y. And you can basically drop that into the calculation so that people don't have to go to different sheets to do what they want. They don't do anything like that. It's just simple, it's straightforward, it's clean. So the idea of what we're talking about here is really about packaging the analysis for the person that's going to read it. We don't necessarily need to um, make a dashboard for everybody, but when we make a dashboard, it's important, right? There we go. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Know your customer when you're building a dashboard. Understand what they want to do with it. Does my, my executive has 20 seconds to consume the data that I have? Do I want to make them go to another dashboard? No. Make a widget. Make, it, make, a, make a parameter that lets them you know, consume that data quickly. Is it boring data? Yeah, make it pretty, make it fun, make it exciting. The other thing, I, I, I actually went to a session yesterday that uh, were, was talking about how to make a dashboard beautiful. And one of the things that I thought was pretty common knowledge was using the eyedropper um, to match the color. So they sent me this Teaching Thursdays dashboard icon, right? This guy right here. Well, you can't see it on the screen. Top left. Um, 
it, it's basically their marketing logo. So you can actually grab the color from that and make your borders and your font and everything match that color. That makes it pretty. It makes it exciting. It's all good. So things like that are very important. All right. So here's where we get boring, <clears throat> if I'm not boring already. You guys, you guys are bored? Yeah. All right. <laughs> So at step eight, we basically sit down, and this is where I package that analysis, and I go through and I make the dashboard. Nine and ten to me are things that I think that we always fail at as, as analysts and, and reporting people. I put together this dashboard, and it's beautiful, and it's amazing. I published it to Tableau, you know, and nobody ever sees it because nobody knows that I actually put it out there. Nobody knows how to use it. It's complicated. So if I write a novel and I put it on paper, and it sits there in my, in my office, in my desk, and nobody ever publishes it, nobody's ever gonna read it. So what's important about it? So, so this is something that I need to do. I need to go out to my customers and show them what I've done and how to use it and how to consume it. Um, the other thing that's really cool about this is that we don't always know how our customers are gonna use the information. So it, it's basically, I put together this awesome dashboard, it's perfect, it answers your question. Um, I don't really want it, I don't like it, I don't know what to do with it. Okay, well, what do you need? So that leads into the second step, or the, the last step, which is revise and iterate. So nothing is ever done. I don't know if you guys have the same thing, but with me, when I build a dashboard, I can't leave it alone. I can't just sit there and, and go forward and, and leave it. I always go back and I clean it up, I fix something. I learned this really cool trick, um, you know, at Tableau Conference, and I'm gonna apply it to all my other dashboards. Or I sit down with my customer and try and teach them how to use it, and they're like, you know, this isn't really me. This is not how I want to consume it. This isn't good. And so I go back and I fix it. So I run reports all the time on how much that my people are using the data, what are they doing with it, uh, the dashboards are they opening. If I see that a dashboard is not being used, I kill it. What's the point? You know, if nobody's using it, it's, it's useless, right? Um, but if I see that somebody's using the dashboard but infrequently, that drives a different decision. How do I go out there and say, you know, what do you need differently? Why, are these, why is not everybody using the dashboard? So I want us to say, step number nine is communicate. Educate your customers, sit down with them, figure out what they're doing with it. Number 10 is to fix it. Go back and, and clean it up. If you don't need it anymore, delete it. it. It's not useful, it's not taking up space. But if you want to clean it up and make it better, you can, it's good. All right. So, so we're almost done, but I want to go through this. So we went through these 10 steps, right? So step number one is plan a little bit, go with it, identify the data, grab what you need, submit the requests, go through it, collect it. It could be ETL, it could be somebody handing you a spreadsheet, it could be emails, whatever the case is. Clean and enhance, get rid of the stuff you don't need, join it up with the stuff you do need, and make it better. Understand the data, this is talking to the customer, realizing what they think my definition of XYZ is. The, 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 the kind of anecdote I have with that was, you know, I had a customer that, that had a two data sets together and it, they had product hashtag. So I talked to them, you know, this, this product hashtag from this data set from that data set, is that the same thing? Does product hashtag mean product number? Is that a unique identifier of the product? Is it a, a volume of product? You know, how many products do you have? Is it a hierarchical product one, product two, product three based on category? And I had to get that out of the customer's head before I could join those two data sets together because I can make an assumption that product hashtag means the same thing, but it's not always the same thing. Experiment, so this is where we use our brains. This is basically, I think this is what the data's saying. I'm gonna prove it, disprove it. This is where like kind of our, our actual amount of work goes from. Apply logic, this is, I thought this happened. Is this right, you know, we would talk about Saturdays and Sundays in a call center, volume drops. Yeah, cool, I don't care about that. So we actually, uh, when we look at call center data, we have to exclude Saturdays and Sundays from our call center because it skews our averages and our numbers and things like that. Package the analysis, build a dashboard, write a post-it note, write an email, all good. Nine and 10, we just talked about with communicate and educate and revise and iterate. So these are the things that we need to go forward. Once we do what we need to do, we need to take that past um, just building the dashboard, thinking with our brains and sit with our customer and make sure that what we've provided is the right thing that we've provided. I want to make a point that these steps are not linear. We all know as analysts that if I spend 20 hours working on something, it doesn't mean I'm 20 hours closer to being done, it just means I spent 20 hours. Also, these steps do not have to be exclusive. We go all around with this. So we could go from one to the other and then back and forth and there's not just 10, one to two, it's, it's all over the place. So I put this visualization, this graphic in here to let us know that we realize that 
analysis as a profession is a circular, circular process. It's not linear. And we go through these things together, um, back and forth, and, and never, and a lot of times we skip steps, you know, we don't need to do this, we don't need to do that. So we have to understand that it's, it's important to go back and forth. And the little point in the bottom right is one of my favorite things. Don't be afraid to start over. Anytime that you put something together and you go out to a customer and you package it and they're like, yeah, that's wrong. I spent 30 weeks processing this. What do you mean it's wrong? No, that's not what I want. Okay, cool. What do you want? Every time we go through a process and every time we, we produce something, we learn, we figure out something. Even if what you learned is that that's not the right thing, um, it, it's important. So it's okay. You know, analysis is not a linear process. So if I go through and I produce this beautiful dashboard, nobody likes it, nobody uses it, start over. It's okay. It's all good. You know, you, you've learned from that process. You, you're not, we're, we're sitting here, we're analysis, we're analysts, and we realize that the job is not to produce a dashboard. The job is to provide an analysis to someone who needs that. Keep that in mind. So if the analysis isn't hitting the mark, isn't right, start over. It's all good. All right, so let's talk about unicorns. Everybody's asleep, I know. This is kind of a dry subject, it's all good. Unicorns in a term from a recruiting, from an HR perspective, are people that have every single skill set that you need and they meet that role, right? I've given you these 10 steps. A lot of them are very technical. A lot of them overlap, a lot of them don't overlap. So with well, the team that I work on Nationwide, we realized that I'm not gonna hire somebody who has all these different skills together. Because one, if you did find that person, um, which is hard to do, it, they're, they're expensive. They, they cost a lot of money. Uh, and two, that if you do find that person, their resource demand is so high that you never get time with them. So what we actually ended up doing was developing a team. So uh, now that I know these 10 steps from data to decision point, I know what's needed. I know the skills that are needed. I can break that down into skill sets. And if I hire these people together, one, you have overlap. So this person has this skill, this skill, this skill, and this other person has these two that overlap together. That's redundancy. That means it's good. The other thing about it is it's scalable. So I basically have a workload X. These people are sitting here doing this job together. I now have a brand new workload that's huge and I can just duplicate the entire team. I know what I need, and it's good. So, so unicorns, we talk about that, it's like there's one person that says, I know everything to beginning to the end. Yeah, sure, it doesn't happen. We, we know that it doesn't happen, it's not likely. But the thing that we do find is that I can put together a team of people that have all these different skill sets. It's important for hiring managers and, and, and team leaders to know what those steps are and how to grab each one of those people and put them together. So a team is, always gonna be better than a single individual that has all these things. So I'm not saying these 10 steps, a lot of these maybe resonated with you guys. Some of them are like, uh, I don't know what that's talking about. It's important to know what happens. It's not important to know that I need to do that. So maybe every single step along the way, like I have no idea how to do ETL. Like I, I write SQL code and I don't know where it comes from, it's so good. But you need to know that ETL happens and where it comes from. And you need to know who does it. Because if I can go over there and say, you know, my data didn't refresh today, where do I go? Who do I talk to? If you don't know who to talk to, then it's not good. So, so teams uh, make, make, the, make the difference. They're very good. All right, that's my spiel, guys. I hope you guys liked it, and I would love to have questions if you guys have any. We've got plenty of time. I talk fast. Questions? Go. So uh, investing in a data mart versus data wrangling? Investing in a data mart versus data wrangling. So that's a great question. So, I always go back to what's the need? Um, is my customer, does my customer need a data mart? Do they need just a, an extract in Tableau that combines things together? It, it always is the, the first couple steps where we talk about identifying the data and planning and things like that, that drives that, that discussion. So do I need a data mart? The answer sometimes is yes, the answer sometimes is no. Um, it has to meet the need of the customer is the way I go with it. Anybody else? So the question was is that uh, we, we talked about certain tips and, and points about uh, color and things like that. Are there other tips in my arsenal to, uh, to, to meet the customer need? And I, I, I'll, I'll go back to that. The, the fact is that when I talk to a customer and I produce a dashboard, I listen to them. And they say, you know, this doesn't work for me. 
what doesn't work about it? So, so I'm communicating, I'm educating the customer. It's like red, yellow, green on this dashboard, it doesn't mean anything to me. Let's make it blue and orange, whatever the case is. So that is a dialogue. There is never a straight answer to what is, the right an what is the right way to communicate to your customer. It's always about what does the customer want you to communicate to them. Um, and so talking to them, working with them on a regular basis is as absolutely the only tip that I have for you. There are, like, we can go out to Google and we can find all these different tips about, you know, uh, HR customer likes this, a uh, uh, production customer likes this. Sure, we can all do that, but what does your customer need? What do they want? And that's a dialogue. It's a conversation. And, and we can't get away from that. We need to sit in the room with them and say, what do you want? What do you want to see? If I need the icon in cornflower blue, it's going to be cornflower blue, right? So it's, it's, it's a good question, but the answer is really complicated because it's whatever they want, and that's the way to go with it. Our job as analysts is to provide that story to those people, right? So I tell a story, I know that piece of the story, and if I can't give you the whole story, then I'm not doing my job correctly. So, so we have to go through and have that conversation. Cool. Any more questions? Go ahead. So my question is about uh, distributing the story. So okay. are you... Um, Asking people to like self-serve or are you pushing it to them? Can you talk about that a little bit? Elaborate. So like um, we've got all these wonderful dashboards our company has built and now everybody wants us to take screenshots of them and put them in a PowerPoint and email <laughs> it. So I'm, it, that, we we're trying to get that, over that right? cultural barrier. And sure. just, any so, ideas? So the idea, so uh, I, I say this thing, uh, the, the question if you guys didn't hear it was is how do you distribute? What do you do with this? So people that are taking snapshots or screenshots of their dashboards and putting it in PowerPoints and going forward with that. If I sit down with someone, and that's step number eight, what I was talking about, which is the communicate and educate, right? So I, I always ask somebody, what do you do with it? What are you going, where are you going forward? And a lot of times if they're like, well, I take a screenshot and I put it in a PowerPoint document, we all cringe, right? And I was like, why? What are you doing? Just go to the website. It's all good. Um, but that, to me, is, is learning. Uh, and that, that goes back to the tips and tricks, right? So if someone is basically screenshotting something and putting it in a dashboard, maybe they want to add commentary. Maybe they want to do else with it. And I need to add that commentary into the dashboard. So um, this, is, this is really kind of anecdotal, but think about, what was it, about 10 or 15 years ago when, when music pirating was a big deal, right? People were downloading stuff from Kazaa and, and all these other things in, in Pirate Bay, um, and, and it was huge, right? So the F, uh, whatever, the FFA, FDA? Not the FDA, whatever. They put these restrictions down. They arrested people. They charged fines and things like that. That wasn't the right way to go about it. What did Google do? Google's like, well, everybody wants all the music all the time. What's the answer to that? Well, if you charge them like 10 bucks a month, then they get all the music they want and they can download it, then we keep getting their 10 bucks a month consistently, right? So the answer that Google came up with was not about you know, restriction. It wasn't about governance. It was about giving the customer what they want. So I always do that. I love to get down and I watch somebody do what they do with it. So if they print it out to a PowerPoint document, why are you printing it to a PowerPoint? What can I do? Additionally, that will give you that. So a really good example is somebody told me, I print this out, I put it in a PowerPoint, and then I write commentary about it. So this, this data gave me insight to X, Y, Z. Okay, so one, can I provide that insight directly in the dashboard? Is there a question you're asking that I can answer on a regular basis? Or two, can I put that commentary into the dashboard directly so you don't ever have to print it out? It's, it's always there. So we actually had uh, Tableau sucks in text files. It's, it's fantastic, right? So I said, okay, this, this text file, on the network share is where you put your commentary in. And it automatically will pull it into a dashboard for me. And, and it worked beautifully, right? So I never have to go and print, copy, paste, send. It's basically, I'm gonna go to this web file, this, this CSV, this text file, notepad, and type in stuff, and then it automatically shows up in my dashboard. And that was a success for me because then they don't have to get a single snapshot, they don't have to take those extra steps. It's just words, it's not really that important, but it's important to them, right? So that dashboard then had a little section over the side that was, uh, commentary about that. And that commentary could change every month and all this good stuff and, and all that stuff. So you build in that, what is the customer doing with it? How do I make it better for you and how do I eliminate that step for you? Okay. Anybody else? Go ahead. My audience doesn't what? What do I do if my audience doesn't agree with my story? Well, one, they're wrong, right? <laughs> no, so, so that's a really good point. So, so I put together a, a story, I tell a story, and they don't like it. To me, that's, well, either we missed a step along the way, we didn't get the requirements right, we didn't understand what they were talking about, or there's business logic that we didn't grab, right? So to, to the point of what I was talking about, Saturdays and Sundays, 
I gave um, my, my call center data in an average across the week. And they're like, that's not how long our calls take. Well, you're right, because I forgot to get rid of Saturday and Sunday, things like that. If your customers don't agree with your story that you're saying, if they don't agree with the dashboard, then we as analysts have missed something, right? So the customer, I know it's silly, but the customer is always right, but they are. They're the ones who are consuming the data and they're making the decisions based on it. So if the answer is, is that the way you're consuming that data is wrong, then I did my job poorly. If the reason is, is that the decision you're making is bad because you don't like the data, well, that's personal preference. I can't do anything for that, right? And, you know, I don't like the fact that my sales numbers are low. Well, then hire more salespeople. Um, but we have to understand that we go back. I always assume that I did something wrong, and that's the way I go about it. And, and if I can prove that that's not the case, then I can have that conversation empirically with that person. Look, you think that the data is wrong. It's not wrong, but you gave me this information, and it's, it's showing real, real data. A lot of times they'll come back to me and say, well, you forgot to eliminate X, Y, Z, or these outliers don't count. Okay, cool, let's go back to that. But at the bottom line is, is after I've had that conversation with them, they realize that it either is or it isn't. And it's not a like or dislike thing. It's a basically, you, if you have all those business logic empirically documented, then you're good to go. You don't have that. So I would, I would say the best way to go about it is assume that you're wrong as an analyst and make that an, uh, an incorrect hypothesis, right? So if I can go through and say, I think I'm wrong, you don't like it, let's, let's fix it, and then you prove that you're not wrong, then you have a better, better place to stand on when you have that conversation with them. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where. So this is a great point. So so the question was about you have too many hypotheses to prove in one in one go. So I know that X Y Z is possible, but there's you know 16 other variables that could affect that, right? Where do you go with that? Um, and the thing that I always sell that is, I need a team. I'm not one person, I'm a team of people. So if I can basically say, you take the first three, I'll take the next three, I'll take the next three, working collaborative with people is always, is, is, is gonna be the right solution. So identifying the hypothesis that you have is perfect, right? And, and the amount of time that you get through that is very quantifiable. So if I go to my customer and say, look, it could be 16 different things that are going through here. Um, and I say, it's gonna take about three weeks to get that decision to you to understand that. And they're like, oh, three weeks is not, not good. I need it tomorrow. Well, then I need to bring in about 15 other people to help me do this job too, right? Um, it makes it a really easy conversation to say the, the work that's quantified, I know that there are these, these widgets that could has, possibly happen. It's, it's easy to go to your customer and say, because I know all these variables could happen, I'm gonna need this much manpower to solve the problem, right? Um, and, and absolutely, you can't gloss over the fact that I have this hypothesis and I need to prove it. You can't say, eh, it doesn't matter. You need to know, you need to understand that, you need to tell that story. Um, and, but being able to quantify, I know that I have these questions to ask, it's gonna take X number of people to answer those questions. Your customer is usually very receptive to that. So, okay, um, I need this answer tomorrow, well then I need 15 people. Well, okay, I don't need it tomorrow, maybe next week, right? You know what I mean? Okay, I only need five people to do it. So I think that the answer to your question, uh, what do you do when you have multiple hypotheses that could drive that? Bring in other people. Bring in extra people to answer those questions for you because many minds think better than a single mind and it's, it's always collaboration. It's a team. Good? Yeah? Thank you guys very much. Oh, one more. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So if you would ask me that question two days ago, I would have a very different answer. But if we listen to the keynote yesterday morning, right? The CEO from Honeywell brought this, this idea to my mind that was amazing, that I thought was really cool. So when they talk about data governance, they didn't, they didn't operate from a restriction personality. They operated from an enablement perspective, right? So governance as a, as a tool was 
in my mind, historically, it's, you know, I need to make sure that people are doing the right thing, where they know what it is, and all this other, you know, restriction, you can't, you can't get to that because you don't know what you're doing, all this other stuff. What she talked about was really cool to me, which is they set up a person who knows the data and can enable and support the people that, that consume that data. So their, their, at, their approach to governance was not about restriction, it was about enablement. So to me, governance is more about understanding what you have and being able to provide that understanding to your customer than it is about restricting them from not being able to do that. So if I'm a consumer, I need to get this dashboard um, and I need this data that goes into that. Well, if I want to mash two sets of data together and it's wrong, I'm going to do that on my own. But if I have a person or, or, or a team that can say, hey, I want to mash these two pieces of data together, how do I do it? They'll do it for me and they'll do it correctly and they'll tell me how and why and, and, and all these things about it. So I'm going to start pushing that envelope in my company because it's important. Like, governance is so frustrating because people say, I want this but I can't have it. And, and at the same time, it's like, well, why do you, why you can't have it? What is the reason you can't have it? And the answer is, is because nobody's told me how to do it correctly. If there was a person that told me how to do it, then it wouldn't be a question. You can go for it and knock it out. It's good. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for your time. I appreciate it. Have a great day.